Okay. Um, I haven't had anybody join yet, but I think I'll go ahead and start. I had a few things that maybe I would uh, cover on unsupervised learning here um, and maybe talk about the assignment five, and then we'll see if anybody joins and has um, some questions uh, in real time here. So, um, so yeah, basically we're up to the point, we've got two more weeks of classes. So um, we've just got one more unit here. Uh, well, really I kind of started you guys on this unit. Uh, before the Thanksgiving break, dimensionality reduction, unsupervised learning. I'll talk a little bit about that. So, so yeah, these last uh, two weeks here, we're looking at unsupervised learning uh, methods. So basically clustering methods and um, um, uh, the uh, principal component analysis, which is a type of dimensionality reduction, okay? So I'll try and talk both about both of those today. Uh, maybe I'll talk some more about dimensionality reduction, the PCA, next week uh, because next week we've we've also got kind of a, a topic just a, a more high level topic some it's the reading from our textbook about general advice on applying machine learning it's a good um, um, chapter to read of course from our textbook so uh, we can talk a little bit about that content uh, next week as well so as a reminder so there's assignment five i still gave you um, all of this week and next week uh, to work on it. So it'll be due um, at the end of our last week of classes. And then we are gonna have a second test. Uh, it'll be similar format to the first. It'll be online based um, and it'll be an IPython notebook, uh, probably with like, um, um, probably with one question on PCA or something like that, you know, some unsupervised learning question and maybe another question from the, um, um, support vector machines or something like that, something that we covered uh, a little bit more after the the, the first test. And okay. so I'll talk, talk more about that next week once I've kind of started making it and things. So. Um, all right, yeah, and I think that that was all the announcements that I had. So, um, um, you know, as usual, you know, start make certain you're working on your assignment five. Um, I did, like, like I posted here, I did um, make some updates on there. So make certain that when you bring up your assignment five, um, that it has the right date. That means you have the right one. So if you go to the assignments, um, and if you open up assignment five, if you don't see the 2021 date here, you might not have the, the correct one. So you need to do a git poll in that case. So one, you should be able to do a git poll from the terminal inside of your, um, is that true? Um, so like if you do like a, a, a new terminal, so you'd be a terminal on your virtual machine. Um, oh, and uh, you have to change into the um, ML Python class. But if, if you're in that directory, um, and you do a get pull, it should pull it down front for you. You shouldn't. Uh, have to merge or anything, I don't think. So I'm just gonna write that out. Um, and, um, and exit, just to go ahead and have the, the uh, get pull work, right? So maybe that, that should pull down if you don't have the most recent version of the assignment, that should pull it down if you do it from there. Uh, let me know if you have a problem with that. Uh, if you do, you can also try it just from your host machine. So you should be able to um, um, do the git pull from there as well um, to pull it down. So, so either one I think should work. So the only thing is that, uh, yeah, if you've been, if you've been hopefully, I mean, you know, you like you've been working along and actually making changes for like the lecture notebooks and things. So you might end up having like a conflict between a local change that you had and um, um, things that I had down there, in which case um, it might not pull it down cleanly for you. So if, if you see something like that, send me um, the, the message that you get. And usually what you should do is you should just um, delete um, any files that you modified locally and do the git pull again, right? And if you want to save that work, you can just copy it to some other uh, temporary directory and then delete them and then do the git pull. It should pull down clean stuff then. So. Um, all right. So I probably won't talk too much about the assignment. Um, I'll talk more about it next week a bit and, and maybe talk more about PCA. Um, 
um, principal component analysis. So let, let's get started on unsupervised learning. So um, as I mentioned in here, um, I, I didn't have a recorded lecture video, so you should watch the Dr. Ring's videos um, um, on unsupervised learning and then also on the PCA um, that he has. Again, some really good coverage of these things. Plus, of course, read the um, um, uh, from our, um, our our textbook, um, the um, uh, chapter eight uh, is about the dimensionality reductions and things. So I see I've got some stuff in here that I should modify, uh, update on my description for um, the unsupervised learning here. But, um, but yeah, so I thought I might say one or two things about it. So um, um, probably won't take me too long um, unless some people jump on here and ask some questions about this or other things. So. We're talking about unsupervised learning here these last three or four weeks. So th th this represents a, a big shift from, you know, th this is a, 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 a completely different kind of thing that we're doing when we're doing unsupervised learning than what we've been doing up to this point in the class in the first two thirds of the class, okay? So, so most stuff in machine learning, um, is some version of supervised learning um, or you know there, there's lots of other kinds of things semi-supervised and um, uh, and doing different kinds of learning reinforcement learning things like that but most of those you're using some sort of a label um, and you're trying to build a model that can take the inputs and make a prediction on the label or or, or like for reinforcement learning you're using some sort of a signal about whether the, the output is good or bad, right? To, to reinforce, you know, to, to try and guide the learning, right? So in, in, in all those cases though, you've got something um, that the learning algorithm can use to modify its model to become a better predictor or a better performer on the task that you're trying to do. So those are, those are kind of what supervised learning um, has, okay? Uh, what it's about, right? And then, and, and, you know, this was just in this lecture notebook, um, you know, this was kind of a summary, again, of Dr. Ring's video, but um, this is just a, a, super, a summary of supervised learning. So in supervised learning, you have a set of M inputs and you have labels for those, okay? So these labels, if we're doing a classification task, like a binary classification task can be just, you know, true, false, or yes, no, right? Um, I mean, you know, the, the, the labels could be more than, than two categories, you know, so you could have a multi-class problem. The labels could be a real value numbers. So in that case, instead of a classification problem, it's a regression problem. But, but still, in all those cases, you're doing supervised learning, right? So you've got the uh, inputs, you've got the labels, and you're going to apply a machine learning learning algorithm like linear regression or logistic regression or support vector machine or a a tree or any of the methods that we've talked about so far to build a model that can try and make predictions uh, from inputs of the same type and make correct predictions, right? So it so give you um, the output. If you're doing a classification problem, give you the, the output of one or zero that um, is hopefully correct for that input, even though it, it was an input it wasn't trained with, hadn't seen before, right? So that, that's that's what supervised learning is in a, you know, in, in a relatively quick nutshell, right? Um, so for unsupervised learning, um, we are no longer interested in building a model to make predictions. We're going to be using the data that we have and trying to, to have the algorithms tell us, find some structure in it, okay? So that's that's maybe the easiest way to describe, especially something like clustering, is that we've got often some very complex data, multi-dimensional, so, so here, you know, on these examples, we're just showing you with two features, X1 and X2, but real data is gonna have thousands or tens of thousands or even millions of features. Um, and, you know, and that's going to be impossible to visualize um, and uh, it's going to be very difficult just by observing the data or doing uh, other standard sorts of data visualization or data exploration kinds of tasks. Uh, there's lots of stuff that you might not be able to, to discover just by um, trying to explore the data by hand, okay? So that's where we're having some tools of, like, that are in this class of unsupervised learning 
um, these kinds of tools can be helpful then to help you discover structure in the data that you might not otherwise be able to visualize or find, right? So that, that, that's what we're trying to do when we apply something like a clustering um, algorithm. There's two main kinds of clustering. That there's just simple clustering and there's hierarchical clustering. Um, I didn't talk about hier hierarchical clustering or give you videos on this. Um, I, I, our textbook might have mentioned it a little bit. I'm not certain. Um, but, um, um, but, but this is a basic clustering here. So, so let's say, so for unsupervised learning, we're given the same sort of source. It, it could be the same input, but we don't have labels. So, so M unlabeled samples of data to use, right? So here we've got M inputs. They're all two dimensional. So they all have two features still. It's actually the same sets of data that we had labeled before here. Um, so, so as already said, for all these, we're, we're giving it the algorithms of data and we want it to find some structure in the data, okay? So in this case, for the k-means clustering that we'll look at, we want it to try and basically come up with like categorical labels, right? So, so find things that look like um, related clusters uh, of, of data, you know? So, so again, this was just made up data, but supposedly there, there was two, you know, it was like a binary classification task. Um, and all of these were like the true or positive labels and all these were the false ones, right? So the idea is, is that, I mean, if you just look at this, can you find things that are kind of clustered together, close together? Um, and those might be things that are similar to each other that um, um, a, a common label of them would make sense, right? If we go back and look after the fact at the clusters that our clustering algorithm found, we might find that, the, you know, this cluster basically is this kind of class that's discovered, or maybe, you know, a combination of two classes or something like that, okay? If that makes sense, right? So. Um, like Dr. Ng says in his video, like, like, like a common thing is um, that should be market segmentation. Um, so you might have a, 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 a big data set of a bunch of um, users or customers. You might do a clustering algorithm on it, and then that might be able to find uh, um, customers that are in different categories, right? So you've got your sports enthusiasts um, are here, and you get your uh, uh, geeks and computer shoppers here, things like that. And then and that might not be a real great example. I'm kind of coming up with the cusp, but that's that's what we're going here, uh, here, right? Or you know, like um, um, Netflix might do something like this. I mean, you know, they have done stuff like this, but uh, uh, try and find. Um, try and uh, cluster uh, the, their, their customers, their watchers of videos into different groups. Um, and, and that way, you know, if you kind of categorize somebody in a group, uh, you know that from things that other people have liked in that group, uh, people that were in that kind of category might also like those. So, so you might, might wanna, you know, push those uh, in, in order for them to eat more easily discover those types of movies and, and be more likely to stay with the service, that, that type of stuff. So, so that's that's what we're kind of doing when we're applying clustering here, right? Um, social network analysis. So, um, so for example, some similar stuff that I've done, you know, so you might take social network data, like if you're trying to discover uh, bots um, uh, posting on social network, you might apply clustering. Um, and then uh, use that information. So if you have an account that you, su that you um, suspect is a bot, other ones that, that cluster in the same way might also be uh, suspicious of, of being a, a, a bot. Um, so that kind of thing, right? So clustering can be very useful um, and for lots of applications here. So, the one algorithm that, that we look at uh, for unsupervised learning, the the, uh, the most basic, but still the 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 one that's most commonly used is k-means clustering. Okay, so uh, we we looked at previously a supervised learning um, algorithm called k-nearest neighbors. So they have some similarities. Not I mean not least of which with the k in the name. So so the k in both cases is because. Um, um, that's kind of like a meta parameter. So here for k-means k or k sometimes also called k-clustering. Um, 
um, K is going to be the number of clusters. So we have to tell it how many clusters we want it to find kind of before we have it run the algorithm. And it will try and, and, and uh, group all the data into that number of clusters that we have, right? So for K nearest neighbors, remember K was the, the number of neighbors that we should use, the, 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 you know, the, the, the number of the K closest neighbors in order to make our predictions of things for the supervised learning, right? Um, okay, so um, in, in Dr. Ring's videos, you know, we, we mostly restrict our, um, we, we mostly restrict our uh, examples to a binary classification task, right? So, so we've got, um, um, you know, we could form two clusters, right? But, but of course, you can use K, three, four, or whatever, right? But, but clustering really is a classification. Um, it's not really, um, um, doesn't, doesn't really make sense as like, like uh, as regression data, right? So, so, um, so we mostly are talking about um, making clusters of uh, some sort of labels, basically, right? So, so, so trying to cluster data into groups uh, that you could give uh, some kind of categorical interpretation um, to the groups that you discover. Um, um, so, um, the pseudocode for, for the KD clustering is so simple that, uh, in fact, we pretty much laid um, uh, showing the implementation of it by hand. Uh, in this notebook here, right? So it's pretty easy to implement, uh, but kind of similar to the k-nearest neighbors as well. Um, so, so the algorithm can, for, for k-means clustering can be described as this. So you start off by starting with the sum set of k-clusters uh, randomly chosen somehow, right? So, so if k is two, um, I'm going to I'm going to have two clusters, mu one and mu two. Somehow I'm going to randomly choose those two clusters. Okay, so. Um, I'm skipping ahead there. I'll come back to that. But, but yeah, you know, so if this was our input data that we're trying to, to cluster here using k means. Um, I just chose, and I want k is two. I want to find two clusters. Uh, we just ended up choosing you know, one of the clusters here where x1 was basically zero and x2 was minus two. And the other clusters up here where x1 is two and uh, x2 is four. Okay. Um, so then you just repeat, repeatedly do this. Um, so you assign each of the uh, inputs to one of the clusters. So one of the two clusters here when K is two, right? So every one of these inputs is gonna either go to cluster one or cluster two, right? How do you assign it? So you, you determine which cluster each point is closest to, okay? So all of these points here, are close to this one, so they'll be assigned to this cluster initially. And you know, all these over here are close to this one, so they'll be assigned there. So, so you know, to figure out closeness, we use the uh, measure of distance again, like we talked about for k nearest neighbor. So the easiest kind of um, measure of distance is just Euclidean distance, right? So if all of your features are numeric, like x one and two here, you can just calculate the Euclidean distance in the normal way, the the um, the sum of the squared difference, the, the square root of the sum of the squared differences, right? Um, so um, um, that's what our distance function is here that we use in the, the notebook here. So we take the, the difference, we square them, um, and this is doing this in a vectorized way. So X and Y can be vectors of two, three, or n dimensions. Uh, this will take the difference, you get the difference of all those dimensions. This will square all the differences, and then that will sum them. Um, and I guess, yeah, to get the actual distance, I should have taken the square root here. But, you know, uh, it doesn't really matter because um, whether you, as long as you're taking the square root of all of them are just taking the sum of the squares. Um, this will always determine which cluster is closest to which point, right? So, you know, to do that, to do this first step, jumping back here, I have to calculate the distance um, from for each point from that point to all of the, the current positions of the cluster, right? So in this case, if I have two clusters, I'm going to calculate two distances, this distance and this distance. 
And then since this is the shortest, I will assign this point to be in this cluster. So we'll call that cluster one, or we'll try to call it cluster zero and cluster one here for two clusters, right? So, um, anyway, so that's what the, the C is. Um, and then though, what we do is, um, you know, so the initially randomly chosen cluster might not be good, might not make good clustering. So what we do is we move these points. Okay, so after we assign all the points to each of the, the initial randomly chosen clusters, um, basically what this is, is this all the points that were assigned to cluster one, we um, take the average, the, the centroid of those points, okay? So if, um, um, so if, if these points here that I kind of circled were all, uh, end up being closest to this centroid, we'll, we'll take uh, to this uh, cluster point that was randomly chosen, we'll take the centroid of these, okay? And by the centroid, what you do is you just, you just sum up all of the uh, um, dimensions and take the average of that, right? And that will give you the centroid. That'll give you the point that's in the center for each of the two dimensions in this case, right? Um, so that's kind of what the mu k is here. So, so that will end up moving the, the, the centers. And we keep repeating that. And basically, at some point, this is going to converge. So to keep doing this, um, uh, when, you, when you move or, or when you assign the points uh, for one iteration, and then you come back and assign the points again for the next iteration, the points will end up being uh, in the same clusters. They won't have changed to a different cluster. And at that point, the, 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 um, the calculated uh, 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 centroid won't change either, and, and um, stuff will stop changing. So as soon as stuff stops changing, that, that means that the algorithm has converged, okay? Um, so, so here's an example of um, rant, you know, the first step. So um, one way we could select these two points at random is just to like, like, so X1 goes from like negative five to seven, let's say. So we could just choose a, a random value between negative five and seven. Um, and for X2, we could choose a, a, a value, or I guess it went from negative four to six was our maximum. And then the other one went from negative five to five. So just, just choose a, a point at random um, on the real value uh, line, number line uh, between those two, and that becomes our center. Okay. So notice, I mean, the the the, the k means clustering is not deterministic. So if I did this cell again, um, it should pick two different points, unless I set the seed here. I don't remember if I did that. So let's see if I can run that again. Um, so um, so yeah, if I oops oh um. um uh, the, the data change here because I used a different data set. Let, let me um, uh, let's, let's restart the kernel and clear all that. Um, and let's run everything up above that so that I can run this multiple times, right? So if I run it one time, um, and this really all we're doing um, is randomly creating the, the the, the two cl clusters in this case, and then plotting them against our data here. So if I run it once, I get my two clusters there. So notice this is different than it was before. If I do it again, uh, my two clusters over there, right? So th these are just being chosen randomly. As I later on say here, or as Dr. Ring says in this video, I, actually the more common way to choose the, the, the initial location of randomly the clusters is just to pick uh, points in the data set, right? So if I did that, instead of choosing two random locations uh, within the, the range of my um, you know, X1 and X2 features, I would just pick two of the input points at random and set the, the initial cluster at those two places, right? So that works as well, and, and that's a more common way um, and probably a more understandable way. Okay, so that's the first step. And now we're going to iterate here. So what we have to do to iterate, um, uh, you know, we have to have our measure of distance. So you can just use Euclidean distance. You can use other measures of distance. We, uh, our textbook has talked about those before. So like Manhattan distance or um, there's other kind of things. But 
um, Euclidean distance is fine here. Of course, you always have to be careful. So if some of your features are um, categorical, you know, distance might not make sense in that case. Uh, so you have to worry about whether you're, you know, change it to a one-hot encoding or other stuff like that. So all that is kind of implied on, on, on doing the clustering well. Right? I mean, you know, as long as your features are uh, numeric, like real value numbers or even integers, where distance has a meaning, um, then the clustering would work well. But like a variable that's categorical can be more problematic unless you can figure out some way to enforce a meaning of distance along that uh, feature, that dimension. Uh, um, so some notation here, but all we need to do is, is calculate the distance between each point and, and every centroid. Um, and we want to find the minimum of that in order to assign um, the value, right? So, you know, um, there's some examples here. Um, um, oh yeah, these two distances are, are equivalent, right? So here, you know, if we use the, the, the norm here, that's the same as, as calculating the, the sum of the, the square differences. Um, um, so the conclusion though is that, yeah, so from our two initial random points that we had before, if you did that, all the points in blue were closest to this initial cluster point, and all the points in red were close to that one, right? So it's, it's a little bit dust to tell, so what, you know, how did that one end up being closest to that one? But, um, but uh, yeah, that hopefully is correct. <laughs> it looks, you know, it must have been pretty similar, but um, anyway. Um, so once you found that, then now we're going to actually move the uh, points here. So this is what I, I call, you know, uh, recalculating the center, right? So we're going to calculate the center of mass, basically, is another way of thinking of it, of the points that are blue here that were in this cluster in the center of mass. So that's going to move one of these basically to somewhere in here, kind of in the, the, the in directly in the middle of all these points. It's going to move the other one somewhere in here, you know, kind of in, in the middle, right? And that's a, a, a minimization um, kind of thing. So Dr. Ng talks about it in this video, I believe here. So whenever you do that, you're really minimizing kind of the cost function, the optimization objective uh, that he talks about here. Uh, so, so by moving these uh, centroids, we reduce the, the distance to the minimum that we can uh, between all the points that are in that cluster and the current cluster center, okay? Um, so anyway, what that looks like, um, um, so, I mean, in Python and using NumPy, it's relatively easy to do that, to, to calculate the, the, the cluster centroids, you know, by like using the mean function. We just want to use the mean of the, the of the, inputs that are currently in cluster K, you know, where cluster K is zero and one if we're doing two clusters here, right? Um, so if you do that, you get the do these two new centroids and that's like I was saying, so right, they move basically, this is the, the point that minimizes the distance for all the red points between it and there. And that's, that, you know, that's kind of what a centroid is. Okay? Another way I think about this, if, think of these as weights on like a plane. That would be the point where you, would, if, if all these weights were exactly of, of equal weight, and they were all one pound or one gram, that would be the, the, the point if we got rid of the red points. That would be the point if we put our finger there that would exactly balance um, uh, these weights here, right? So, but, but you know, it's, it's basically the, the, the point that's the, that minimizes the distance between all of these blue points right here. Right? Um, so, um, 
Oh, and, and I mean, that's not quite it. So basically, once you've done that, that was like just one iteration of the loop I was talking about. Once you've done that, though, it could be the case that um, if you go back to, the, to that step and calculate the distance between each point uh, and, and these two new uh, um, cluster uh, uh, um, points, some of the points might switch. So, so now, for example, this point is probably closer. That might be the only one that switches, but this point is probably closer to this center than that center now, right? So, so if we if we um, um, if we did this step again, um, which I think this will work. So if I go back and do this step, it'll recalculate the distances, um, but after having moved the, the, the cluster point for that. I, I, I'm going to go ahead and try it here. So now we'll see that. And, and yeah, like I was saying, so you can see that um, this point here has, has switched. So now it's in this centroid. And that's probably the only one that, that, that switched there. So, um, and then if we do that again, no points will switch. And at that point, so now when we recalculate the centroids, this centroid will shift a little bit. On well, this one will too, because a uh, point got removed out of it, right? Uh, but then if we calculate again, probably no points will end up changing, switching clusters at that point. And at that point, um, the, the centroids won't move anymore, um, and the uh, algorithm will be said to have converged at that point. Uh, right, so we, we would stop the algorithm as soon as the cluster stopped changing. Right, if, if, at that point, it's found the, the minimum point that it can. However, um, as Dr. Ring talks about in his video here, um, the the, the k-means clustering, as it's normally done, is a um, is a greedy algorithm, right? So, so from the the initial starting locations of the clusters, um, you can actually end up with different uh, final cluster locations, okay? Or, or another way to say that is, is, right, if you think about the optimization function here, the, the, the cost function, uh, unlike the cost function that we had for uh, logistic regression um, um, or other places, um, this is not a nice concave function with a single global minimum. So there can be local minimum on this cost function, right? And so depending on where you, you randomly start your clusters, you could end up at different local minima, all right? Um, so, um, What that means is that normally for, for when you're doing uh, k-means clustering, you don't want to you don't want to just run it one time because you could find um, a, a minimum that's not very good that, that's uh, a fairly non uh, uh, you know a fairly bad local minimum right. So normally what you do for um, k-means clustering is you run it multiple times. Um, so that, and, and you remember, and, and you use the, the cost function, so you remember what cost, um, you know, was achieved for running it, you know, each of 50 times. And, and then the, the best one that you have of this is the one that you keep, right? Um, and in fact, you know, if you use k-means clustering from Fact Learn, it does that kind of automatically for you. So, um, Let's go down there and look at that. So, um, um, oh, here, yeah, in this video, he talked about the, the random initialization. So, like I was saying, um, so it's more common to just pick, you know, if, if I have, if I want k to be two, I just pick two points in my data set as my two initial locations for the cluster instead of um, randomly picking points correctly within the range. There. Okay. I don't know if there's any theoretical difference between those. So. Since it's since it's probably easier to understand that is, is, is why you probably just do it like that usually. So. Um, oh yeah, and um, so really the only thing that that's kind of um, um, 
that, that you kind of need to make a decision about if you want to do clustering is what, what do you want to use for K? How many clusters do you want to create? Okay. So sometimes from the data from the application, you might know that, um, um, you know, that there, there should be like three or four clusters here for whatever reason you might know that. Okay. But other times you might not, you might not know what a good number of K is. I mean, so in that case, um, uh, you can try clustering for different, you know, for, for all different values of K, one, two, three, up to some N. Um, and then you can look and, and then, uh, you know, as we talked about in the video that at, at the point where the elbow of the curve, so, so somewhere where the, um, um, the, the slope changes from, um, 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 being faster to being slower. That's what an elbow is. Uh, you have to look at the, the formally, you'd have to look at the, um, the derivative. Um, but, um, um, but yes, yeah, that elbow, that's usually a good value for K. That's where you're kind of getting the maximum kind of use of the clustering, right? But you can, you can often just plot that and visualize it. Um, 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 and what, what you're plotting is the cost. So, so for each value of K, you, you plot the cost. You know? So again, you know, if, if you have more clusters, of course, you're going to be able to get smaller overall co costs, right? Uh, because you'll have more places and, and the points will be able to be closer to, to a cluster center, right? Um, so, but anyway, um, I don't know, maybe, well, I think later on I do show an example of that. We'll, we'll come down and see an example of plotting that because we're kind of looking for the elbow there. Um, okay, so with scikit-learn, um, like I talked about, um, so here we're using, going back and using the, um, um, uh, oh, um, yeah, we're just using the data we were using up above. Um, again, so you get some more clusters again here. But um, uh, like I was mentioning, um, if you read the description of the scikit-learns uh, k-means clustering, um, so max iterations is, you know, in case you have something that has hard that it's kind of tough to convert. You can set it so it doesn't go more than, I guess by default, it doesn't do more than 300 of the iterations that we talked about where you find the closest center and then recalculate and move the, those centers using the centroid and keep iterating that until things stop changing, right? Um, but uh, the number of inits um, in, in clusters is, is uh, um, K here, right? So normally you specify the, the, the number of clusters that you want. Um, so here, but by default, um, K-means is actually doing um, the, the clustering 10 times and um, it remembers the, the best. So it, it does it 10 times, it calculates the cost, the, the final cost using the, the, the cost function um, like we showed here um, and it keeps that one just to make certain that you don't in, end up in a, in a bad local minimum, right? You know, 10, if you have really complex data, might not be enough. So, you know, you might have to uh, increase that um, to be bigger in order to ensure that you get something that's, um, um, you know, you can never be guaranteed that you'll find the actual best minimum clustering by the, the cost function, but, um, if you do it a sufficient number of times, where sufficient is going to depend on the number of dimensions that you have and kind of the complexity of your data and the, the, the number of clusters you're trying to create. But if you do that a sufficient number of times, you should find something um, that's um, pretty close, if not the global minimum. Um, All right. Oh, yeah. So um, um, he, he he discussed that more in the video. I discussed that a little bit more in the um, our textbook here. So I mean, you can do that by hand, you know. So um, um, if we just ran um, the k-means uh, like a thousand times, um, and we we remembered the result of doing the clustering. Um, 
So here we're just running it a thousand times, k means clustering a thousand times, um, and we can see that um, um, uh, in this case, um, uh, I mean, yeah, so th this data isn't very complex, so this isn't in a, in a good example. Um, uh, but uh, we end up with basically the, the same results, no matter where we start randomly, right? But if we have some data that's um, slightly more complicated, um, um, oh, this, this is an example of, uh, of um, Case three, case four, so on like that, right? So by the bend, that, that's the place where the 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 uh, the slope um, um, is uh, having to is is not. So, so here, but you know, we kind of know that this data had two anyway, but um. um um, when you are uncertain about your data, your data is more complex. It's going to be useful for figuring out what a good value is. Paying. I'm <laughs>